Welcome to The Wild Side. I'm your host, Kyle Shepard. I am standing in the Islands Day Room. It's one of the many buildings open during the winter. Of course, the zoo is open year-round. We're open 10 to 4 through February, so don't forget that. You can come and visit us in the winter. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about everyone's favorite polar bear, Kunnick. We're going to talk to Jane Ann about what she's been doing with Kunnick and her little journey here to, to get here from Alaska. We're also going to talk to Keeper Hunter Veneman about his trip to Churchill, Canada with the Polar Bears International. We're going to talk about the black-footed ferret and the anniversary of the rediscovery. And then finally, we're going to talk to you about how to get half-off tickets to the zoo uh, through a dare to care program through February. Stay tuned. We're back here at Glacier Run in the upper water viewing area. I'm with Jane Ann Franklin, the assistant mammal curator and supervisor of animal training. She's also known as Cunnick's mama around here because she took care of Cunnick uh, during her stay here early on during quarantine and has helped ease her into the Bear Alley, acclimated, acclimating into Bear Alley, and now in this big water exhibit. So what have you been doing with, with uh, Miss Cunnick lately? Because last time we checked in, she was still in quarantine. So she'd just gotten in, she was still in quarantine. Well, her horizons have expanded greatly. She's gotten very comfortable in Bear Alley um, using the overhead and uh, coming into the large glacier exhibit step by step, very easily, transitioning having a short period of time out there and now working up to several hours at a time swimming but just like a kid we don't want her to get too tired so she is out for several hours and then we she goes back to Bear Alley okay so she started out in Bear Alley and there's if you've been to the zoo lately you've seen 3,000 pieces of enrichment items in her exhibit she just spends all day just exploring that exhibit and learning a little bit and a lot of that is some hardwired behavior that you're observing her and learning about bear, be bear management right yes her her pouncing behavior that's very characteristic of polar bears smashing things if something gets in her way slapping things tossing things up over her back those are things that I've seen other bears do and it is something that is just innate she just it's just what they do so we try to stimulate that natural behavior by developing things like a fake seal and putting it in different contexts where she has to pull on it really hard to get it, but you will see her pounce. Boxes that some are really easy and really flimsy, others are very tough to break into um, so that she has to really judge her strength and the power she's going to use to pounce. I've heard you talk many times about her problem solving skills, that she's got a really, she's just super smart. You talk about her brain being a sponge and how a sponge and how smart she is and how she just solves problems left and right. If you do give her lots of boxes that are put together or inside of each other, she knows how to peel those apart. That's anything that is, tends to be a challenge for her, she'll work on it for a little bit, then she'll back away, go play with something else, and while she's playing with that other thing, you can almost see the wheels turn and she comes back with a solution. Getting the dog igloo out of the truck bed, figuring out how to get high to get something that she wants. Looking at us, and looking at a toy that she wants to play with. We do play tug with her with a tug rope or a t piece of tug fire hose. She will look at that fire hose and look right at you and you know she's going, hey, I I'd like to play some tug of war right now. And so you, you start to see her intention when she looks at something. You can see a plan formulating. You've guys, you guys have learned a whole lot because you observe her every moment that she's on exhibit here. What have you learned about yourself or about animal management in general and particularly about her and bears? I, and every time I raise youngsters and we get new animals, I've learned not to put limitations on those animals myself. If we can think it, if they can perceive it, they can do it. And you have to be very careful about the information that you put into their brains because it's going to come back out the way they would like for it to come back out. You've got to make sure you're not giving her a lot of tools that are going to cause you problems down the road. Uh, building a ladder, for instance, might not be a good idea at this point in time. Uh, and learning about her, that she is, her brain is like a sponge, it's very malleable, that she flexes it and uses it in different ways, and you typically only have to touch it one or two times, a couple of exposures to something, mm -hmm. and then she's got it. It's not a big deal. And that approach and retreat, letting her almost teach herself, but being there to support her while she's learning it, makes a huge difference. You may not see her acknowledge us a lot when we're out there, but if you watch every so often, you'll see her take a look and check to see where one of us is sitting. If we get up and move, she's immediately aware of it. And that makes sense. She would be immediately aware of her mother if her mother started moving on. Sure. 
So when she first got here, like I said last time we talked about her, she was in quarantine. And all of this has been an acclimation process. It's been a step-by-step -step process acclimating to Bear Alley and now to this big exhibit. So how do you go about that, that, that acclimation? Well, you watch and you see where her brain is. You see how confident she is and whether she is looking for new challenges. And that might be the, the less interest in favorite toys. That might be her exploration of the very perimeters of her exhibit and then allowing her to have access but always being able to come back to a safe place. And when we first let her out, she was out for about 50 minutes. That was enough. That was enough for her that day. And then she does look across Bear Alley into the big exhibit. She sees the grizzly bears using that. And I do think she's watching them and using them to use that space and going, you know, I was over there yesterday. I, you know, when I get back over there, I'm going to do what they were doing. Um, types of things and making sure that we don't overstimulate her. And like I said before, just like a ch child, we have to make sure she doesn't get too tired and get tired out there in that big pool. But she is quite the swimmer. Speaking of being tired in that big pool, we've seen her swim down, and she swims and swims, and then she's, I guess, is she pretty buoyant? Yes. She's like, they, the baby bears are like corks. You can't keep them down. And so, yes, and if you'll notice, too, when she wants to come up, if she's wanting to come up, she'll stop swimming. She'll stop moving her legs all the, together. Arky does the same technique. Arky works her way down to the bottom, and then if she wants to rise, she just stops, and she floats right to the top. So a lot of what you're teaching, you know, the, the, the visitors out here is about rotation. In the wild, you might not see exactly what you want to see and when you want to see it. And that's the same here. We're trying to portray that here. Can you talk to us about bear rotation? Bear rotation includes the fact that we have bedrooms for these guys off exhibit, that the space in there it rivals the space that they have outside with, with uh, quality, with enrichment items, with time off not always being under the watchful eye of everybody all the time. They need some privacy too. Um, giving them different venues, different textures, different times out, not setting a schedule. There are certain things that are on schedules, the sun rising, the sun setting, things like that. But throughout the day for them, things are never on a schedule. You never know who they're going to run into either. So giving them different perspectives and not letting them anticipate things uh, so that we keep them guessing. And every time a door opens, they want to go through it because there's always something good on the other side. Finally, um, you talk a lot about um, how what we're doing here with Cunnick and what we're learning from Cunnick could potentially shift the whole paradigm of the way zoos handle bears. Can you talk a little bit about that? Shifting that paradigm, bears, bears are way more complex and way brighter, I think, than a lot of people give them credit for. If you think about where most bears come from and their problem-solving skills of being able to survive and stay alive, they have to be on guard all the time. So we need to stimulate that brain. It may not be that same feeling of being on guard all the time, but you have to use that brain matter somehow and use, and, and use that energy. And my goal is to give these bears tons of things to do during the day so they're good and tired and they sleep just like I sleep at night because they're wearing me out. <laughs> Technically, the last sort of um, wild-born young bear cub work was done about 10 years ago at the San Diego Zoo. So you're really breaking new ground with this. Did you lose a little sleep at night? I, uh, she's constantly on my mind. All the bears are, making sure that we're doing exactly what's right for these bears, making sure we're coming up with new and different ways to make sure that they're stimulated, that they're using their brains, and that they are continuing to problem solve. Because not only is Cunnick a cub, the grizzly bears are cubs still too. They're still babies. So, and we have to transform their mother. All these animals are individuals, and we have to work on each one of them as an individual and figure out what they need and what works for them. So yes, all the time, always on my mind, thinking about it, days off, there's nothing for me to have a notepad and be scribbling stuff down so that I don't forget. Thanks, Jane Ann. You're welcome. You can come see Connick between 10 and noon and 2 and 4. Those are the best viewing times to see her. Uh, also check the website at louisvillezoo.org for the best viewing times. Uh, she's great fun, so come out and see her. We're back out here at Glacier Run. We're outside now with Hunter Veneman, who just got back from a leadership camp with Polar Bears International. And if you don't know anything about Polar Bears International, they are the leading authority on conservation, research, and education as it relates to polar bears. And these leadership camps take folks like Hunter who have a vested interest and not not even a vested interest, anybody who's interested, and it takes them and it immerses them in the real habitat on the tundra in Churchill, Canada, the real habitat of the polar bear. So 
Hunter, what did you? What was it like spending a week? I think the the camps are a week long. What's it like spending a week in the tundra? Uh, it's definitely a, a change of pace from here in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, but it's not that far away. Um, a lot of people that come out to the zoo think polar bears are a, a distant animal that lives half a world away. When in all actuality, you could get on a plane and be in polar bear country in about two and a half hours. So a lot of people don't think that we're that close to polar bears, and they're actually in our own backyards in, in some ways. Well, they are one of the North American iconic species, and their habitats are, are in a little bit of, um, you know, trouble. And so that's what you're learning about there is how to sort of go and, and connect with them and, and then bring that back into your own community. So, so what's a typical day like in, in, in Churchill? Uh, out on the tundra, we actually get on what's called the tundra buggy, and that was uh, actually funded by Frontier North Adventures, which actually has adventure tours that you can charter and go out and see wild polar bears yourself. And the whole purpose of our trip up there was to go out, see polar bears in their natural habitat, to better understand what is happening to polar bears' habitat, and to really connect ourselves with the leading scientists and polar bear scientists to really get a nice, good, concise understanding of what's happening so we can bring it back here to our own communities and actually make a positive change to help save the polar bear. So what's it like, I mean, what's it like seeing a polar bear where you could reach out and maybe touch it? Not that you would want to, but that, I mean, the tundra offers that first-hand experience and first-hand sighting of, of a polar bear in the wild. What's that like? It, it's very surreal. The first polar bear that I saw in the wild actually wasn't even in snow, there was no ice around. It was actually out on the tundra, which was actually very grassy, uh, green vegetation. And it was, it was very unusual. It was very, it's, it's much of a, even though I work with polar bears, your mind thinks something else when you think of polar bears. You don't think of seeing a polar bear in, uh, in, a, in a grassy tundra area. But sure enough, that's where we saw our first polar bear and she was a female. Wow. We're, we're sitting in front of our polar bear alert signs within Glacier Run, and those are real authentic signs that exist in, in Churchill. Is that right? Absolutely. Churchill, Manitoba is just like other, other northern uh, states that have to work with uh, or to live with uh, grizzly bears. Uh, but up in Canada, they actually have polar bears to contend with. So polar bears are a natural part of life for, uh, for individuals that live in Churchill. And uh, it's actually, you have to really be on your guard. Uh, during the polar bear migration, polar bears will walk straight through town. Uh, they actually have a very good uh, conservation effort to uh, thwart off polar bears that are coming into town, make sure they don't become problematic and they don't become nuisance animals. They want them to, to pass through and make their way up to the Arctic ice. So they actually have a very, uh, very good uh, program for dealing with bears like that. And the sign that you see behind us is actually one of the signs that they have. Just illustrating to people that this is polar bear country and uh, you have to really be on your guard. Absolutely. So part of what you, part of the curriculum, if you will, at this leadership camp is to learn conservation and sustainability so that you can bring it back to your community and plug in with your own projects. And I know you're working on one. We're probably not ready to talk about it just yet, but um, a few of our other keepers have been to this same leadership camp and they've uh, worked with Acres for the Atmosphere. So I'm sure you'll plug into something like that. Uh, what I'd like to do is be a continuation of Acres for the Atmosphere. Uh, Acres for the Atmosphere, for people that don't know what it is, Thank you. Yeah. it's actually a, uh, a program where we actually get trees and go out in the community and actually plant them. Now, there's several ways that you can uh, contribute to uh, the program. You can do uh, a program if you just want to donate money to it called Trees for You and Me, where you actually uh, will donate money and a tree will be planted and maintained. Uh, in the polar bear forest, which is up in Wisconsin. And, uh, but if you really want to roll your sleeves up, get your hands dirty, and make a positive change in the community, then you can actually uh, join an effort such as Acres for the Atmosphere, where we'll actually go out and do tree plantings. And that's your way of reducing your carbon footprint. I was just about to ask you, what does a tree in Louisville, Kentucky, have to do with a polar bear in Churchill, Canada? Well, scientists have found that excess CO2 in the atmosphere is actually helping raise uh, mean global temperatures and that's actually having an effect on global climate patterns. So reducing that atmospheric CO2 is really critical in actually thwarting off climate change. Some of the ways we can do that is reducing our carbon footprint altogether so we reduce the emissions that go into the atmosphere. 
Other ways we can do it are do things like planting trees. Trees actually reduce the atmospheric CO2. They actually uptake it and release oxygen. So that's another way we can reduce the uh, atmospheric CO2. So it cleans the air is what it you're saying? It cleans the air, exactly. Right. Thank you, Hunter. You're welcome. Um, if you want more information about Hunter's trip and all the other keepers who've been to Churchill, Canada, it's all on our website at louisvillezoo.org. Also, there's information about the Acres for the Atmosphere program that we just spoke about and how you can pledge to help us plant 500 trees, which will, in, in effort, help uh, the habitats for the polar bears. It's all on louisvillezoo.org. Now we're here at the Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center here at the zoo and in late September we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the rediscovery of the Black-Footed Ferret who was thought to be extinct as late as 1981. And we also at the same time celebrated our 20th anniversary of participating in a captive breeding program. Um, and I'm here with Angie Cox who is a keeper at the Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center. She's going to tell us a little bit about this rediscovery and how they were considered extinct. Yes, back in the late 1970s, these guys were thought to be extinct. They were the victim of decrease in um, their primary food source, which was prairie dogs. Prairie dogs are considered a pest species, so not everybody wants them around, and also disease. Um, so they were thought that they had all died out. Back in 1981, out in Matitsi, Wyoming, there was a rancher's dog, his name was Shep, brought his owners a carcass. and. Um, they had absolutely no idea what this was. The wife thought it was pretty, so she wanted to have it stuffed, so they took it to the taxidermist. The taxidermist said, oh my gosh, I know what this is, and um, it alerted the authorities, and in comes all the scientists and biologists. They studied this population for a couple years. There was about 150 individuals, and then they suddenly noticed there was a sharp decline in the population. It was because of a disease called canine distemper. They got permission, and they were able to capture about 18 animals with the intent of starting a captive breeding program. After a few years they finally you know started figuring these guys out and were able to start breeding. Once they got enough they wanted other sites because they didn't want this very very endangered animal all in one place where a disease or a tornado could knock them all out in one swoop. So in 1991 our former director Dr. Foster um, had said if you ever had the chance to get in this program he wanted in. So he got us in in 1991, we got our first ferrets. 1992, we had our first litter. Um, 20 years later, we have had 876 kids born here. Wow, so there, you said there are multiple sites. I think there are about 18 sites who do this, but? There are 18 release sites, but there are only six uh, sites that actually breed these guys. And so we're pretty successful with 876 yes, kids. Yes, we are. And then how many of those have been released back into the wild? 701 have survived and about 550 of them have actually been released um, out into the different sites. That's great. And where are the sites that are in the wild? Um, we have sites out west anywhere where there's prairie dog uh, populations um, starting in Canada all the way down to Mexico. Um, they're on Native American land, they're on private land, um, and they're on federal land. They have to go um, on land where they're wanted because as prairie dogs are considered a pest species and it's what these guys eat, they have to want the prairie dog in order to want the black food fair. So it's one, one with the other, so yes. the, because the primary food source is, is the prairie dog. Yes, 90% okay. of their food comes from prairie dogs. Wow. So are they still considered, although these, this captive breeding program through zoos across the country, are they still considered endangered at this point? They are still considered endangered. They're not um, as endangered as they used to be. There's about a thousand ferrets uh, out in the wild. There's between two to fifty in captivity um, that are active in the breeding program, and there's also fourteen zoos that actually have uh, these guys on exhibit once they've retired. This has to be pretty fulfilling for you to know that you're actually helping a species that could have been extinct and no longer existed, and you're helping them. It is. Um, Prior to getting a job here, I didn't know these guys existed. I have learned a lot about them. Um, and it's very neat because these are the only babies produced in the zoo that are actually you know we're gonna go out in the wild. You know, a baby giraffe is gonna stay in the, in the captive population, but these guys get released. Um, and it's, it's really neat. I've actually been out to a site in Kansas and actually seen them out in the wild. And it's really kind of full circle sure. and kind of fulfilling to see these guys. 
Oh, out in the native habitat. It's the fruition of what you're doing here yes. to, to see that. So they look a lot like a little baby ferret that I might have in my house, but they're completely different. They are not. Um, domestic ferrets, the kind that you and I would have as pets, are descendants of the European polecat. These guys are American. They're completely American and um, never been domesticated. They're never, ever going to be, I don't think. Um, they'll bite you, look at you twice. So they're cute and furry, but they're, they'll, bite, they'll bite you. They are wild animals, and we treat them as such. And we treat them. We don't handle them. So tell me a little bit about what we're seeing back here. They're all awake, and, and they're nocturnal, but they're awake right now, it looks they're like. They're awake right now because they're getting ready to be fed. Um, so they're up asking where their food is. Um, I don't know if you can see, but we have a little nest box on the floor, which is supposed to represent the prairie dog burrow with a little tube that goes up, and then on top is the cage floor. So that's our how we you know, kind of give them space to go and how they can practice going in and out of the tunnels. Once the kits are about 90 days old, they will go out for preconditioning and they'll learn how to navigate the prairie dog burrows and kill prairie dogs. Um, they'll use those little black tubes to help them figure out where to go. Talk to me about a prairie dog, because when I envision a prairie dog, I'm envisioning like my dog, but they're not, that's not the a case. A prairie dog is a ground squirrel. These guys, the females are about 800 grams, males are about 1,000. Uh, the prairie dogs will outweigh these guys two, three times, um, and prairie dogs are cute and everything, but they're kind of the meat nugget of the prairie. So they're, but they're bigger than the they ferrets, are bigger. but yet they're the prey item for ferrets. Yes, and how that works out is these guys are nocturnal, the prairie dogs are not, so they will sneak up on the prairie dogs while the prairie dogs are asleep. Oh wow! And uh, they'll kill a prairie dog, you know, two, two, three times a week. I guess that is the nature and the circle of the food chain. <laughs> and these guys have to watch out because there's a lot of things out there that will eat them as well. That will eat them as well. How many are we looking at right here, back here? We have 31 in this facility right now. Um, we do have a couple of retired breeders, but most of them are ready for breeding next year. Thank you so much for joining us. And if you want more information about the black-footed ferret in general and about our, our participation in the captive breeding program, it's all on the website, mobilezoo.org. Thanks for joining us on the wild side. I promised you information about how to get half price admission to the Louisville Zoo this winter. Through February, we're doing a food drive with Dare to Care. So for every canned good you bring, you get half off admission. That makes a, a child's ticket 525, that's 3 to 11, free for under two, of course. And an adult admission is 695 with a canned good for Dare to Care. Last year, we participated in this, actually two years we've participated in this. And you guys have helped us to raise 8,000 pounds of food, which equals about 6,000 meals for struggling families in Kentucky. Anna. Thanks for your help with that. Use this canned good program, bring a canned good in, get half price admission. Come see Cunnick and Glacier Run and all the good stuff here. Thanks for joining us.